present at the creation. That's not just a concept we've been immersed in all day. It's the title of a great book, a book that won the Pulitzer Prize in 1970, written by somebody who most people today have never heard of. The author was Dean Acheson. Dean Acheson was an American diplomat during the years of World War II, and he became Secretary of State under President Harry Truman. Dean Acheson was one of a small group of what were called, unironically, the wise men. A group of people who, out of the ruins of the post-war world, imagined, designed, and built the web of institutions that still, in some frail way today, shape our world. The Marshall Plan, the United Nations, NATO, what would become the European Union, the International Monetary Fund. They were present at the creation of a new world. And I've been thinking about Acheson and his generation and that cohort and his book for a lot of different reasons, not least of which the last few days I've been spending here in Christchurch. My, my first time as an American to New Zealand and recognizing all the ways in which this community itself has been present at a recreation, a reimagining of what a city can be out of the ruins, not of war, but of disaster. It's not just Christchurch, though. This idea of being present at the creation describes the moment we are in all around the world today. We live in an incredible time of, if I may use the metaphor, tectonic shifts. Deep, deep shifts of technology and demography that are changing all the frames of what we think of as normal and possible. Old institutions are giving way to new flattened networks. Hierarchies are collapsing. There's this mass democratization and webbing up of voice. And it takes many exciting, exhilarating forms. TEDx is one of them. Social media, social justice movements that are rising and emerging all around the world, influencing one another, learning from one another in real time. But this moment of tectonic shifts also takes less benign forms as well. Turbulent, even terrifying forms. The rise of ISIS, the rise of networked forms of hatred and bigotry and fundamentalism that are running rampant around the globe today. And so as we think about what it means to be present at the creation of a new age, we are called, every one of us, to think about our lives as citizens, to think about three particular aspects of citizenship, power, imagination, and character. These are the elements that I spend all my time thinking and working on in the work of Citizen University, a nonprofit organization that I run in the United States. But these elements of power, imagination, and character are at the core of everything everyone in this room does and at the core of why we're gathered together here today. So I want to spend a few moments speaking about each one of these three elements. And I'll begin with power. As John said in another occasion, I've defined power very simply and rather bluntly as the capacity to ensure that others do as you would have them do. Now, that may sound a little bit menacing, a little bit threatening. I've learned enough about New Zealand society to know it seems rather impolite <laughs> to be that direct and blunt about the meaning of power. But if it makes you uncomfortable, if it feels a little bit unseemly to you to name power, much less to imagine and reckon with the inequities of power that surround us every day, in our lives as citizens, well then, to quote our young heroine of a speaker earlier in this program today, get over it. <laughs> get over it. We have an obligation as citizens to understand, to anatomize, and to become literate in power. To understand two things in particular about power and how it operates in civic life. First of all, there's this. Power is not a zero-sum game. This goes against a lot of the intuitions we have. When we think about relationships that we are in, whether it's 
a parent to a teenager, or a worker to a boss, or a citizen to an elected official. The instinct that we have is to think it's a zero-sum game. If one person gains power, the other person loses. But the reality is, if you just zoom out a little bit from that scale of one to one, and as so many of our speakers today have been saying, imagine the whole, imagine the greater picture, you begin to understand that power actually is a rather positive sum entity. To put it another way, the more power and voice and agency that people have who have previously been on the margins or at the bottom of a community, the more strong, adaptive, resilient, and yes, powerful that community and society becomes. Inclusion into the ranks of voice, inclusion into the fold of agency is a source of power. That does run against intuition, but here's what doesn't. It can be boiled down very simply. Inclusion wins. When a community or society chooses to integrate immigrants and newcomers, chooses to ensure that people who are ethnic and racial minorities are not second-class citizens, chooses to see people who don't get to call themselves white or male or able-bodied are still understood as normal. When a society does those things, that society becomes more powerful relative to societies that do not make that choice and that cannot make that choice. That's the first thing to know about power. But the second one is this. Power is never simply granted. Power must be claimed. And to claim power in civic life demands a level of literacy, of understanding about the forms of power, whether it is money power, or ideas power, or the power of force and violence, the power of the state to make rules and laws, the power of social norms, the power of social reputation, the power of numbers, vast numbers of people coming together. These different elemental forms of civic power are things that we must become fluent in. And then, moreover, become fluent in the ways that we can move and combine and recombine all of these elemental forms of power. To understand what it means to organize, what it means to lobby, what it means to frame issues, what it means to make arguments in public, what it means to bypass broken systems, what it means to ensure that your voice is heard. We aren't born knowing these things. And even in a free society like New Zealand or the United States, we aren't asked on a regular basis if we would like to exercise these muscles. We must claim the right to flex them, and we must flex them. And I don't have to tell you this because this is the story of Christchurch in the years since the earthquakes, the ways in which this community has not just come together spontaneously in that great Kiwi spirit of volunteerism and problem solving, but has come together to claim voice, has come together to wrestle with the elemental question of power, which is who decides? Who decides what the shape of the city will be? Who decides what this precinct will have and that precinct will not? Who decides what your city council will look like in a few years? Who decides when next spring Sierra gives way to another entity and a different way of making decisions about the future of the city? Who decides? That is the question of power. And it behooves you not only to reckon with that question intellectually, but to practice it, to get out there and try and play and fail together, and over time, to win. Well, this brings me to the second element of citizenship that I wanted to speak to today, and that is imagination. I define imagination simply as the capacity to conceive of what is not. And that capacity, most people, again, have this knee-jerk reflex, this intuition that says, imagination is one of those things that either you got it or you don't. And most people beg off and say, oh, I, I, I don't have that. I'm not one of those imaginative types. I beg to differ. Everybody in this room has a capacity for imagination. Some people have been cultivating and developing and practicing it. Others have let it lay, fallow, uncultivated. But it's there. And in civic life, the power of imagination 
is palpable. If you think about what it means to imagine new ways of seeing one another, seeing the world we are in, to imagine, as Dean Asheson's generation did, what it is like in the immediate aftermath of a war in which zero-sum thinking was bloodily palpable, what it must have been like to imagine a future of interdependence, to imagine an ecosystemic view and not an atomistic one, to imagine the institutionalization of empathy and common cause. That kind of imagination cannot just be the province of one small group of wise men in one moment in history. That kind of imagination is the job of all of us. Now, the absence of imagination in civic life can be very painful and costly. It can take many different forms. One form is simply a failure to see consequences, a failure to recognize the ways in which our linear step-by-step -step actions can create exponential consequences. We all are learning about that in the context of climate change and the ways that we are producing carbon. 150 years ago, Thomas Austin, I believe was his name, learned that when he introduced 24 rabbits to Australia, <laughs> thinking, what harm could it do to have a few rabbits for sport? <laughs> that failure of imagination to see the ways in which exponential consequences arise from linear actions. And there's another failure of imagination that plagues civic life as well. The failure, the unwillingness, the inability to see another as oneself. That unwillingness to see someone in another body as your body. To see all of us as a body. That kind of imagination can be cultivated. It is not simply a matter of you have it or you don't. And the way you cultivate it is you come to gatherings like TEDx. The way you cultivate it is you show up at council hearings and community meetings about the rebuild and reconstruction of a city like Christchurch. The way that it is cultivated is that you make audacious arguments about what a place like this can be when you have an unwittingly, unwillingly blank canvas to work with. Well, it's one thing if you have both of these capacities, a fluency and power and a capacity to practice imagination in public life. That's one thing, and that's pretty good, but if that's all you have, I guess I just would have to congratulate you that you've simply attained the same level of enlightenment and spiritual development that was attained by Adolf Hitler or Osama bin Laden. They both had great fluency and power. They both understood well what it was like to have audacious imaginations, to break the frame of the possible, to do things that were considered unthinkable and undoable? No, a third element is needed if you want to be something more than a sociopath. <laughs> and I submit to you that part of our job here today, it may sound like we're setting the bar pretty low, but part of our job here is to be something more than sociopaths. <laughs> And that missing element that has to be co combined with power and imagination is an element of character. Now, when I talk about character, I'm not talking about individual virtues like honesty and diligence and so forth. Those matter. Those are important. What I'm talking about when I speak of civic character is character in the collective, the values, the norms, the behaviors of being a pro-social contributor to a collective a member of the greater body, again, a non-sociopath. And these elements of civic character are, again, not something that we are born necessarily having. They must be intentionally cultivated in ways large and small. And certainly in a self-governing free society like this one or the one that I am from, it becomes absolutely incumbent upon us to be mindful continuously of whether we are, in fact, cultivating character. The political historian David Hackett Fisher has talked about a comparison of New Zealand and the United States and their political cultures. He wrote a wonderful book called Fairness and Freedom. And he talks about how these two societies, though both descended from the same British political cultural DNA, 
evolved in slightly different ways. So that New Zealand has evolved so that there's a greater emphasis here on fairness, on mutuality, on reciprocity. Whereas in the United States, things have evolved in a way that places greater emphasis on freedom, on liberty, on don't tread on me. But even accounting for those differences, what you see in common across these two societies, what you see in common when you begin to think about what it means to be a citizen of any society, is a basic core thing called responsibility. In the United States, we talk a lot about rights. I stand here today, the day after, as most of you know, yet another mass shooting has unfolded in my country. And the debate that unfolds in the wake of a mass shooting like that is always a debate about gun rights, about the Second Amendment of our Constitution and the rights protected there for people, for citizens to bear arms. In America, we have this overdeveloped conversation about rights and this incredibly atrophied conversation about responsibility. And what citizenship means when we think about character is recognizing that there is no right without responsibility. That indeed, properly understood, every right is a responsibility. And what all of us understand, but particularly you here in Christchurch, who have had to reconstruct a civic society from scratch, is to recognize that when you're trying to cultivate this kind of civic character, it's really not primarily, not even initially, about lawmaking and policymaking. What it's primarily about is culture. How we, each of us, as artists, as architects, as physicians, as students, as parents, as healers, as musicians, as painters, as humans, how each of us can set off a contagion of this kind of pro-social behavior, a contagion of mutuality, a contagion of reciprocity, a contagion of shared sacrifice and common purpose. And that means recognizing that each one of us is indeed a node in a, in a network capable of setting off that kind of contagion. That is the essence of what it takes now. And that is about culture. Whether you're talking about New Zealand or you're talking about the United States. And here in Christchurch, what is so tangible, so gritty and exciting to a newcomer and a visitor is the way in which that kind of culture is emerging in all these different ways. Yes, your great stone cathedral lays in ruins, lies in, in ruins. But just a few blocks away, the glorious monument of the cardboard cathedral, which is as good a metaphor for imagination and resilience as can be found. The existence of gap filler and the work that gap filler has done is probably the most profound metaphor I've ever come across in civic life for what it means to be a citizen. You see a gap, you fill it. You see a gap, you fill it. <clears throat> You fill that gap with art. You fill that gap with voice. You fill that gap with food. You fill that gap with heart. You fill that gap with spirit. You fill that gap with purpose. That's what it means to cultivate character. And so I want to close again in recognizing and honoring the work and the life of all of you who are citizens of Christ Church in recognizing that power, harnessed to imagination, guided by character, this is the blueprint for the construction and reconstruction of a great society. It is the blueprint you have been following, whether you know it or not. But this isn't just about Christchurch. Christchurch stands as it should in our globalized age, in this age of networked localism. Christchurch stands for every town, for every city, for any community in the United States, in New Zealand, around the planet and certainly any community where people have the privilege of calling themselves free citizens. And what Christchurch reminds us is simply this. We do not need an earthquake to clear our psychic landscapes. We do not need ruin and devastation in our physical infrastructure to imagine new ways of relating to one another. We do not need a national emergency to be committed to the integration of newcomers, to the integration of outsiders, to the integration of those 
who in different ways are on the margins of social and civic life. All we need to do is to remember that every single day, what it means to live like a citizen is simply this, to live as if we were perpetually, perpetually and irresistibly present at the creation of a new world, because we are. Thank you very much.